What's up, everybody? Derek Ting here. Welcome to Be Super, where we talk to high achieving leaders so we can understand who they are and learn about ourselves. Today, we have former International Kickboxing Federation Light Heavyweight World Champion, Kung Lee. He's also the former Strike Force Middleweight Champion, defeating UFC icon Frank Shamrock in 2008 with most finishes and most knockouts. He was a coach mentor for Ultimate Fighter China Edition in 2013. He's also a prolific action star, having worked with Hong Kong greats like Wong Kar Wai, Yun Wu Ping, Tony Leung, and Donnie Yen. Please welcome Kung Lee. How you doing? Thanks for having me. Awesome. So let's jump into it. I wanted to ask you about um, how you actually got started in competitive professional fighting. First, I started wrestling. And I always loved martial arts. And I started martial arts when I was 10 because I was getting bullied a lot. Mm -hmm. And, you know, coming over here as a refugee, you know, my mom figured I need to learn how to defend myself because I would come home a lot with, you know, like a cut lip or a bloody nose. And so she started looking for a martial arts school for me. I was never consistent. So I never got my belt after like around 10 months. So I kind of like lost interest, but then I found wrestling. Then eventually after uh, my second year in college, I end up uh, going back to martial arts. And from there, you know, I, I found the right fit for me. Someone asked you, did your coach um, kind of ask you, hey, you know, would you be interested or were you, did you sign up as well? Actually, or? actually, in seventh grade, I, I remember I saw all these kids because I, I was, uh, you know, from at the time when I came over here, it's just my mom and her side of the family. She raised me. So I, I used to watch all these fathers take their kids up to, you know, the resting room upstairs at Peter Burnett, where the middle school I went to, and I, I just wanted to see what was going on. So I went up there and I was in my jeans and a t-shirt and I saw all these kids wrestling. I was like, some father said, Hey, you know, jump on the mat, you know, join practice. I took off my shoes, took my socks off and jumped on. And next thing I know, I'm, I'm pinning his son, you know? So, <laughs> and then afterwards he said, good job. And then the coach came over and asked him if I want to, you know, be part of the team. And I said, yeah, sure. And from that day on, I was there. I wrestled year round all the way till my second year in college, mm. you know, became high school, all American junior college, all, like all American wrestled freestyle Greco Roman, um, even Sambo, you know, so I wrestled year round competitively. When you <clears throat> jumped on the mat, did you feel like, was it just kind of like, okay, let's just see what happens. I know you, like you said, you had a tough back background, you know, refugees coming to the States and everything. Was there any part of that? Or was that a natural did you feel like you're just a natural at wrestling or when i jumped on the mat i felt like i i had something to prove and it was like a one-on-one -on -one. and then i you know i think a lot of being bullied and picked on and called names i had an outlet so i use that as an outlet and i fed off like my fire and i fed off of everything that has happened and i mm -hmm. and then here's a chance for me to do something about it then eventually compete, you know? And then, uh, you know, I came in the first day, I got paired up with a not not too tough of a guy, but then the next day the coach put me up against someone who was tougher. And I mean, I got my my ass handed to me, but I I, I was in there, I, I was in the mix, I didn't quit, you know? And then uh, I just came back the next day, the next day, and then I say two months later, and that guy's been wrestling for a couple of years, you know, I, I started edging him, I started getting closer, and then that's kind of how I, you know, kind of judge where I'm at. And it's, it's always, it's always about trying to compete. Can I ask you, I mean, you talked about the bullying too. I want to uh, understand a little, a little of that better too, as well. Did you get into any like really, you know, some fist fights and stuff like that? Or Well, the bullying started where I was getting beat up because I remember my mom told me, try to stay away from any trouble. Don't get in trouble. Basically it just, I came home with, you know, like a bloody lip, bloody nose, a black eye. And my mom says, how come you're not fighting back? And I said, you're the one who told me not to fight back. And she's like, no, you have to defend yourself. Don't go and start trouble. But if someone's picking on you, fight back. So from that point on, I I kind of took it like a different approach. I said, if, if I fight back, these guys, they're bigger, you know, they're stronger. I'm going to have to punch first. So li literally, you know, as soon as I get, got picked on, I, I just didn't wait. I just started throwing punches 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have, you have a history of taking on uh, bigger guys. We'll get to that later. But um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I want to ask you about uh, Sanda. How you got into uh, what's called Chinese boxing? It's a martial arts that the Chinese military took on. Why? I mean, there's a, there's a ton of martial arts out there. I'm just curious why you chose that specific one. So first, I started out in like Vietnamese kung fu and uh, taekwondo, and so the, my teacher at the time taught both, and at you know, at 10 years old, it was a lot of forms and I wasn't consistent to practice because my mom was holding down two to three jobs. She had a third job, but whenever they called her. And so I was never consistent going to, you know, any martial arts practice. So I never leveled up. Basically, I got out of it, but I enjoyed it so much. I, I always missed it. So from wrestling um, all the way through my sophomore year in college, my mom was having problems at her travel travel agency. So I went over there and and helped out the family business. And next thing I know, I was like, okay, I'm not wrestling anymore. I need to do some kind of contact sport. And I jumped back into the martial arts, got with the same teacher and started, you know, started pushing. And uh, one thing led to another. Believe it or not, my first Taekwondo match, it was almost like I did so well in practice my teacher would put me in like the intermediates. It was my first time competing. So I got into the intermediate division and I lost my first match, but that guy went on to take first. You know, and it was a really close match. I just didn't understand the scoring. And I was trying not to hit him in the face because in Taekwondo, you can't punch their face. So I was like, you know, I was scrapping. Then once I got the hang of thing, I started going to the point fighting system. I went to continuous sparring and I did Taekwondo sparring. And then I realized, you know, a lot of this, you always have to pull punches. And if you draw blood, you get disqualified. And all of a sudden, one day, we got a flyer that came through the facts. And it was um, Sean Lu's uh, Sanda U.S. Open. I said, wow, you can punch, you can kick, and you can wrestle. Oh, I got to go. I got to raise money for this. I got to go and see what this is about. So I called up and talked to Sean. I said, you can throw guys? And he's all, yeah, you can punch, you can kick. You can kick low, middle, high. You can kick to the leg. You can pick them up. And we'd be fighting off a leotie. I'm like, what's a leotie? He's all, it's like three foot, you know, it's, it's a, a platform. It's, there's no ropes. You can push the guy out. And I said, what if I double leg the guy and jumped out with him? He's like, you can do that too. I said, wow, okay. So I said, send me all the information, all the rules. And he, he sent it to me by fax. And I raised my money. I went out to the U.S. Opens by myself. Flew, no coaching, no one cornered me, and I fought, and I won my weight division, and then Sean Lu, um, I remember him saying, you want to fight for the grand championship against a cruiserweight guy, um, and I looked at him, I'm like, yeah, he's, he's kind of big, but <laughs> do I get any money out of it? He's like, no, you get that trophy. I'm like, I'll do it. And it was like a like a nice big trophy, and then uh, so I jumped out there, and like the first round was a little bit close, you know? Then I started hitting them with the back kicks. I, I remember I, 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 I didn't wrap my hands. I didn't know anything. I was wearing these Everlast gloves. I'm like, man, this is kind of hard to grapple, but you know, I, I was getting it. And then I remember I hit them with the three punch and I remember I going back to the corner and I had no corner. I was like, Oh man, my hand hurts, you know? And I think I, at that time, I, um, you know, you'll see there's a lump here. I broke my hand. And then, so I stopped punching with that. And I, and I, I said, I'm going to try my scissor kick. So I scissor kicked him, I got him down and then he popped back up and then he started coming in harder and I scissor kicked him again and my heel went into right in the uh, solar plex. And I remember getting up and I looked back and he was still on the ground, like on, on his fours now. And I was like, oh man, I won by knockout. This is awesome. I love this fight style. And right away, like I remember um, Sean Liu was giving me my trophy. I'm like, hey, when's your next tournament? When's the next one? He's off. Uh, next one you you got to go to the nationals i'm like okay where's that at he's out in florida i said okay i'm there you know so and by that time it was like a couple months later i had moved on opened up my own school i had a whole team you know and then i went out to um to the nationals and um, brought a bunch of guys had my old teacher with me and i went out there and i kind of dominated the competition and i found i found home in 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 the in the chinese uh, you know free form fighting 
That's interesting. Well, it seems like you have like this open mindedness, like, uh, hey, hey, what do you think about this? And you're like, yeah, hey, let's do this. Or, you know, do you want to? And even if, well, you know, um, you know, a lot of people say, oh, keep your teacup you know, empty. For me, it's keep my teacup half empty because I already come in with knowledge. But the other half is to learn. Even sometimes a student might bring something up. I'm like, good point. Thank you. You know, and that's a lesson that I learned. So, you know, I, I feel that it's all about being open minded. And in order to be the best martial arts that you can be, you always have to be the student of the game. You can't be some sensei or, you know, grandmaster. Because I think at those points, you know, they're too busy teaching and giving back. Because you know how it is in the Chinese martial arts. I will teach you 70%. You have to figure out the rest. You know, it's a family secret. And to me, I'm like, hey, if I'm six feet under, where is that secret going to go? Six feet under with me, right? So I figure, you know, I just try to teach my students as much as I could, give as much as I could. And because the more I give, the more I, 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 I expand my knowledge because I have to be one up on, on the students, you know, after teaching and fighting and then, then turning pro it's, it was, it was, it was a, a life dream that I got a chance to do all that I, I have done. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about a little bit about strike force, because I think uh, <coughs> that's one of the, arguably one of the best matchups in his, in, in the history of uh, ultimate um, fighting. Uh, you guys had, you were on the same age, uh, same height, and weight and you know frank shamrock had won numerous ufc titles in the late 90s and you know broke people's bones he was undefeated in ufc he was defeated oh, he yeah. was undefeated in he was on the yeah, yeah exactly frank exactly oh I, yeah. I i you know from the early days before dana white had even taken on um had bought out the ufc i remember him i remember his name and uh so like that matchup between the two of you. And I think that was the, the right time for you to that's like really, really good matchup. Tell me about that fight, like going into that fight. I know we're, we're jumping into it, but. So when I ended up deciding to go MMA, yeah, I was like, just turned 33. And I already, I already had agreed and, or I was about to turn. Yeah. I was about to turn 33. I think it was in March. So my birthday's in May, end of May. And then um, my promoter, Scott Coker, who's now the Bellator president, had strike force on ESPN with kickboxing. Then he put me in a special fights like in Sanda mm -hmm. um, or in Sancho, right? And he saw the style was so dynamic. And he saw me fight in a in a Russian league called Draka. So I was 2-0 in Draka. I was slamming people all over the place. I was like, I was in the zone. And I, I found something where it was it suited me the best, the punching, the kicking the wheel kicks, the spin kicks. And then of course my strong suit at the time was wrestling. So I felt like I developed the, the, the punching and the kicking to match my wrestling. And I kept growing as an athlete, as a martial artist. And um, I went three and oh, and I was on the same card with Frank Shamrock. I was the co-main event where th this was the second time I was on the card with Frank. The first time I was the co-main event. It was my first MMA fight, and he fought uh, Belroni and uh, Caesar Gracie. Oh, Gracie, right? He fought, he fought Caesar Gracie. Yeah, and then uh, he knocked him out, and then I knocked out my guy. And then you know, people started talking. Oh, that'd be a great fight, Kung Lee versus Frank Shamrock. Mm -hmm. I didn't pay much attention because I was like, I'm still new to this sport. There's still a lot to learn. I still need to make sure my ground game is getting better and improving. Then my second fight, I round kicked a UFC fighter. Uh, he he had his own move. Um, he had this weird choke. I, they, they called it. I, I I can't remember his name, but you can look it up later. But it, <laughs> he had his own choke, jumped at the chance to fight me. So right away, you know, I knew that I had to work on my ground game. Came in, we, you know, I was throwing some kicks. And then I I, I remember I round kicked him as he was ducking in because I, I would watch tape. And I hit him with my shin bone. I, I remember right away, blood was everywhere. It was already c coming out. I remember I, I was on, on like, like in the guard and I picked him up and I slammed him down just because I didn't want all that blood on me. I just wanted to stand up right away. Right. I had a lot of blood on me and then I slammed him and then the referee jumped in and it was like a crazy cut that like, was like almost like forehead to like one end to the other. Yeah. That was my second fight. My third fight, I fought Tony Frickland. And now again, 
I was on um, a co-main event against uh, with Frank Shamrock, and he fought the New York badass on that card. And he ended up, uh, I think, either choked him out or knocked him out. And then I knocked out Tony Freakland. Um, I got a Tony Freakland with the, I call it the ninja toe kick, where I, I, it looks like a front kick, but I whip it as a roundhouse and I hit with the ball on my foot. I remember I, was, I hit him and he, he it didn't phase him. And all of a sudden, it was a delayed reaction. I remember him like, like bending over. I rushed in, I threw a couple of jabs and I hit him with the hook and he fell down. You know, the referee jumped in and stopped it. Then, you know, a lot of talks was like, hey, you know, you should fight Frank. And then um, I just didn't pay any attention. I knew I had to keep getting better, keep getting better. Then I had a, a fight with Sam Morgan, another UFC fighter uh, or a former UFC fighter. And then uh, I remember I was having start getting a lot of elbow problems because all the jujitsu I'm doing and then, you know, not not tapping because of pride and ego. Oh. And then uh, so my elbow was kind of messed up. But and then it went three rounds, but I knocked him out at the, the third round. It was uh, more the matches were because I went, I had a two and a half week in New York where I was filming with Channing Tatum for fighting. So when I came back, my part kept getting pushed a little bit. When I came back, I only had about two and a half weeks to really finish up my training. And I didn't do much out there. I was like all, all night shifts. And during the day, I was like sleeping throughout the day. It was like my first time, like on a real big budget uh, for me at the time. Um, and it was like a full on production. So I was there all day. I was doing a little shadow boxing. Then, you know, I got to know Channing Tatum really well, but from that, after I fought him, I remember Frank was commentating. And I think Frank saw, cause I mentioned that I'm probably going to have to get elbow surgery after the fight. And right away he called me out. He called me out after that fight. I think he, he saw a lot of like holes that he can expose. And, and, um, I accepted the fight. I ended up um, getting surgery anyways, but I, I had enough time to train. I started training, training, and I ended up getting a part in the movie Tekken just because I really wanted to play martial law because that's the character I, I played on the video game on Tekken yeah, yeah. all the time, right? Yeah. With movies, they keep pushing my part, pushing my part. And I said, guess what, guys? I won't be able to stay out there. The most I got is a week. So whatever they did, they they I, I don't know exactly what was it. I didn't even study the script because I was so focused on this fight. Showed up in my choreograph. The last, my last day of filming was like already we're trying to finish my fight scene. And in a, early in that day, a guy who played Jim clipped me, opened up my lips. They had a like a glue it back. Oh no. And then keep it tight. And I finished my scene, went to the hospital, got 21 stitches, went back, I had these stitches hanging out of my lip, looked like I had some kind of infection sticking out of my lip, right? I did all my interviews for Frank Shamrock with stitches in my lip and then uh I get it pulled out the week of the fight first punch or the first combination that he hit me with right in the lip opened it up again I was like shit but um I went out there mindset faith in God and I closed the deal yeah you like broke his collarbone or something in the no I broke his arm <laughs> so was it like a fracture it was broken like this my gosh because you know like I, I was watching him every time he blocked it, he blocked it. Like I'm throwing a hook at him. So he would roll with the kick. And I, I said, okay, keep blocking this. So I kept kicking at that arm. Hmm. You know, you used to set, so you when, set it in up, the third you're round, kind of setting it up. You're, you're, you're setting oh, yeah. it up. In the third round, when I hit him, mm -hmm. I heard it was so loud. It sounded like a gunshot. I remember I going back to the corner and I, and I, I threw another kick in, at his face. Right. And I remember sitting down and, my trainer started putting, like, getting all the, you know, like, putting the, you know, that steel thing on my lip. I'm like, hey, it's over. And he's like, it's not over until it's over, right? And then and I looked at him. He's still on the floor. I said, it's over. Look, he's laying down. I broke his arm. And then and I'm like, can I celebrate? And he's like, yeah, yeah. And right away, we just started celebrating. And, you know, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was wild that night, you know? Yeah. And right after that, I had to go to the hospital, get stitched up. And... <laughs> Missed my after party. I went, I showed up to my after party, said hi to everyone, took some pictures, and was off. And then I remember a lot of the pictures, my my lip was like this. Again, it was like drooping down, you know. So I, I've looked at footage and stuff like that. I didn't didn't notice it, but people don't know that that's what's going on behind the scenes. Well, that you're... After the fight, it swells up, you know. So oh my gosh. 
Yeah, they yeah. should show that, like all the after the fight, like what happens in the recovery. I was open. Barely walk, yeah. maybe. I don't know. I would be like, I can't move the next five yeah. days. And you want to celebrate too. Oh man. Well, yeah, I did drink. A, I had a little bit of wine, and then uh, then I went to the hospital. That's a life that most people will never encounter, for sure. Yeah. Do you have? I one of my questions was, do you have a trainer? Like, you know, um, do you have somebody who has really kind of you know been in your corner? Who's who's you know um, you know kind of like Rocky? I think like that. You know, he had Mickey and Apollo Creed. I think of you like that, or it just see, but it seemingly seems like you've kind of like on your own just kind of like push forward through this but uh, there's a couple like i did most of my training on my own mm -hmm. you know with a with a decent foundation but when i got into mma i started out with javier i did most of my my uh my strike force fights under the aka banner then i did two fights oh i finished out as you know, i still had the aka but you know like javier started getting way too busy and, you know, the fights were getting more important than me, but, you know, because he had Cain Velasquez fighting for the title. And then, not, you know, and now I'm not fighting for the title anymore, but I'm still the main event, you know, or like co-main event or like in Vegas, he went down and then uh, he he worked my corner. But um, I felt like I needed more attention for the UFC level type of fights, you know. Mm. So I just ended up getting one of my old training partners. And, uh, you know, we were on the U.S. team together. We fought Sanda together, Scott Sheely. And then, uh, you know, I told him, hey, you know, I need a guy who's going to make sure I'm not, you know, eating pizza or, or uh, you know, donuts or, or burgers during training. You know, I had to stay, I need to stay, you know, consistent with, with that. And, and he, he came out the first time for six weeks, the second time, eight weeks, and the, the last time for like three months, you know, so... So I, I focused more on like what I needed because over at AK, they, they, they didn't train specifically for anything, but I had to focus on the style that I was up against, you know? Mm. I love, I love that. It doesn't so. sound like, you know, a lot of times nowadays, some of these guys are kind of manufactured or in there. But even like Tyson, you know, they really kind of trained his mentality to act like a, like an animal kind of things, you know, from what I saw in his previous um, documentaries, but. Yeah. But with you, but you his kinda... training was specifically for him. You know, they yeah. were just there for him. Yeah. Wow. So you've had to kind of do it on your own in a, in a sense, I think, yeah. and find your way and what works for you. Yeah. Um, I had a, I had a question. I was, well, I, I kind of chuckled a little bit because you were like, you mentioned when you're in the fight that you didn't want to get bloody. I was curious what goes through your mind when you're in the fight. Like, is it um, some of it, a lot of it you've trained so much or then it's instinct, but seems like you can also kind of like you're you're reading and planning and setting up and and all that in that very short time frame when when i'm in a fight and if it's like my blood then i know it's my blood but like when it the way the blood was coming out yeah you know it was like kind of gushing out of his forehead you know and i was just like dang that's crazy you know let's just get it back on the feet let me try to finish this but right after that kick it was it was pretty much done from an audience member, you just kind of, we're almost kind of desensitized, but you know, you're, when you're in there I, to anyone, I think that would be quite surprising and not knowing how to like deal with the situation. But I, I guess it sounds like you sort of want to just get, then you're just like, okay, here's the goal. Let's, let's finish this match. You're not really yeah. thinking about those other things, which are, I would think are pretty shocking to most people. Like, um, I think we talked about <clears throat> too, when the, when they close the door in the, in the ring as well. What's that's what that's like? I talked to you about that on um on a clubhouse. I wanted to ask you about that. Like when they when they do close that door, are you psyching yourself up? Are you sort of already in that zone kind of thing? Or or what's your what's your kind of where's your mind at when you're right about to, you know, pretty much match up? It depends on the training, right? If I had a great camp, I'm I'm feeling great. But then there's fights that I had to take for one in strike force that just helping out the event at the end of the year. That was actually my first loss against Scott Smith. But then when I went over to UFC, when I wasn't healthy for the fight, and even though the fighters are pushed, you know, if you're in the top, like the main event or the co-main event, back then the rules were not as strict. So 
you know, the bosses up there, the top guys like Dana and, you know, the Fertitas, they're like, hey, you're a company man. Do what you got to do. Go get go get cleared by the doctor. And I'm like, how am I supposed to clear my foot? Or how am I supposed to clear my elbow? Or how am I supposed to clear my rib? Football players do it all the time. Well, in my head, I'm, I want to say, well, you know, I'm not a fucking football player. I'm a martial artist. I'm up against another guy, another high level, you know, fighter that's trying to take my head off and I'm not a hundred percent, but they don't care. You know, they're just worried about the butts in the seats and if their, if their pay-per-view or if their events have the matchup that people came to watch really when, when, with the UFC, my hands were, were tied, but with Scott Coker, Hey, uh, we're not ready. It's okay, but I really need you. Is there any way you can pull this one for me? You know, and that's more like you want to do it for that guy. But like against Rich Franklin, I I was like, hey, I'm on I'm I'm on a walking boot after my my fight against um, Patrick Corte, you know, in Vegas. Then um, you know after that, I walked in on crutches, and Dana White walks past me. I'm in a wheelchair. They're wheelchairing me in, and Dana White's all, "What the fuck happened to your foot?" Or what's wrong? You know, I heard, I think I broke my foot and he was like piss. He's like, I'll make sure it's broken. Check it out with the doctors, you know? And I, I go with my crutches to get helped sitting down on my seat. People start asking questions. You know, most of the questions was for Anderson Silva versus Chael. But then when they, when they opened it up for the, all the other fighters, first question someone asked me, I can't remember it was sure dog or someone, what are you gonna do? Come, you know, I said, I think my foot's broken. I'm going to go back, get it checked out, take some time off. Dana White steps in. It's out there somewhere, you know, and if you look at the post uh, fight for UFC 148, it was one of their biggest cards that year. It was the very biggest card that year. Uh, Dana says, I'm going to take this over, Kung. Kung's going to go home, take a week off, and get ready for Rich Franklin in Macau. This is our first event in China. I'm like, I didn't know anything about that. No one told me anything about what was going to happen, but I found out right then and there with the hurt foot, and I had like nine weeks to prepare. And uh, I was on, in a walking boot for two weeks. That's the business is sort of, you know, I guess is, 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 is well, actually, let, well, let me jump to that question because, you know, how you get thrown into the, some of these fights. Because you had some later career fights with uh, Bisping um, yeah. and Wanderlei Silva. And I was looking at the yeah. stats and I'm like, this, you know, like Bisping has a five and a half inch reach advantage. He's a light heavyweight, so he's and he's seven years younger. So this guy is like this guy is big um, compared to yeah. You but he younger. cut down to my weight. He cut yeah. down to one one eighty five. But the, you know they, he, they drink a lot of water back, and they're clearly heavier. Yeah, yeah. Bigger. That was like a six two or something like that as well. Something like that. But you know, yeah. like for me, I, I love the challenge. Right, that's why I accepted the fight. You know, because he was top five, and I was like, cool. I want a top five. I want to fight, you know, and I, I, I actually, I, I finally got in great shape for that one, but then sometimes things don't work out. You know, it was his night and, you know, he beat me and I did fight with a messed up. It wasn't my or- orbital bone. It was the bone that held up my eyeball that got broke early in the second round. But I said, Hey, I'm here now. If I lose, I'm going out on my shield. You gotta, you gotta kill me you know, to win. And, you know, they, they stopped the fight, but, you know, I, I remember right. I couldn't see. And then the, the, the accumulation of punches, then the last one, he caught me with the knee, right, right in the jaw. And then I remember I just like, like falling down and I, I saw him coming down. I'm like, shit, how am I going to get out of this one? You know? So I just hmm. covered up and then the referee jumped in and stopped it. And I'm like, man, oh, well, you know, four rounds. Just, uh, that's, four round that's just i mean almost went the distance with somebody who's clearly like yeah i mean in in boxing you would you wouldn't match up that way that's what i think you know you wouldn't match up i mean somebody. later on a year later he wins the you know a little bit over a year he wins the ufc title you know so yeah i love that that you <laughs> you took on somebody who was like you know bigger and younger and same thing with one yeah. like, like 220 pounds like you're 185 this guy is naturally 220 pounds. That's a huge advantage. I mean, that's just. But yeah, but the whole thing is I was beating him. I was dominating him. Yeah. Until because that, that fight, 
like a lot of people who don't know, like I didn't want to take away any credit because I fought Vanley, right? But during training camp, and this is a reason why I had to say, maybe AKA is too much for my body at this age. I can't spar every day, you know? So I had to take a step back. Over there, I was training with guys like King Mo and, you know, bigger guys. Hmm. And uh, I remember things got heated up and, you know, next thing I know, I'm lifted in the air and slammed down hard, you know? And I didn't feel it at the time because adrenaline, but like, as I got out to the parking lot, I'm like, oh, my ribs hurt. I drove home. I remember, I, I remember my, my, um, my oldest son was home. I was like, Hey, uh, he has the same name as, uh, you know, I call him Kung Michael. We added a little Michael to it. And he came out to help me in because I couldn't get in the house. I remember I called him Dana. He's all, Hey, my ribs hurt. I, he's all, don't train with a hurt rib. Make sure you're okay for the fight. Okay. What do you, what do you say? I can't fight. It's my first fight in the UFC, you know, and, uh, and already I had Vitor. So the whole camp, I'm, I'm, I'm training with partners all Southpaw because Vitor is Southpaw. Then they switch it and then I'm fighting Vanley. So it's, it's like, a, okay, switch stance, everyone, you know, fight me standard. Again, it was not my night. I was doing great until I remember I came back to the second round and, and Javier's all, man, you're dominating him. Same thing. Slow down your pace, score points. You're gonna, you that's how you're gonna beat. Don't go toe to toe. And I was like, man, I'm gonna try to put him away. I'm getting too tired. He's like, if you're getting too tired, just stick and move, stick and move. And of course, for me, I'm all about, I'm in San Jose. I gotta entertain the crowd. I gotta do more. And then I got caught with the punch and then went down and he jumped on it and he kneed me in the face. I remember, first thing I remember is like, oh man, I can feel my nose crush, you know? And the, when the referee saw it, and, and I remember he was punching me behind the head. And I was like, man, you stopped the fight because he was punching me behind the head. It should be like, let's caution him. Give me a, a little breather so I can come back and finish this fight. You know, I, that's my mentality. Mm, mm. Let me finish this fight. But, and the referee's off. Come, you should look at your nose. I, I'm just taking care of you. I'm like, <laughs> okay, but there's a great, I know a pl great plastic surgeon. Don't worry about my nose. He's on. nope, you're done. So I was like, shit. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, um, numbers are one thing, but skill level, I think you're, you know, um, surpass. I can't even think of anybody who who's who's better than you right now. But hey, you know what? I want to ask you about the scissor kick because I feel like this is like super superhero status. You mentioned it earlier, and that's you're you're known for that. Like, I want to ask you about like, is it more for surprise, or is this something that you're kind of feeling in the moment, like? I think I can pull this off. I think you kind of mentioned it a little bit, but I wanted to kind of dive a little deeper about uh, that because it's a risky move. Although, at least from what I think, maybe you're probably like, ah, oh, no, actually, it's it's pretty, you know, it's pretty sound. Well, I, I, like for San San Show, or like I was getting the the scissor kick even when I was fighting in the continuous sparring world championships. You know, where you can't really hit hard to the face, but you can kick to the leg. You can do like you know different takedowns, and and um. You know, I was, I was just getting it. And I, I, I remember watching Best of the Best, this Taekwondo movie. Sure, I with, know that movie, you know, yeah. The, the Ree Brothers, you know? Eric Roberts. And I was like, oh, man, what was that? What did he do? I said, I can do that. I'll make, I'll make mine better. So I started doing it his way. Then I said, I like to throw the side kick, but I'm going to spin, and I can get a reverse scissor kick, right? So they had, they're jumping in, and they scissor. I would throw the side kicks, hit the guys, and now they're too worried about my side kick. It would cover up and I would sneak it right through and then scissor kick them. So I let that sidekick go behind their back and then whip them and, and take them, you know, backwards with the scissor kick. And that's kind of like I started doing that in practice. And you got to do and you got to attempt these in practice in order to get it in the match. Then it just became like second nature. I was getting everyone in practice. Then I was, you know, when I fought in Strike Force and or in tournaments, I would scissor kick people. It's next level after reverse spinning kick. I mean, I would never even try to throw one of those. And then, but you're doing, <laughs> you're doing scissor kick. So, um, you know, much praise for you on that one. It's oh, amazing. You. So Strike Force got acquired by UFC. So by by all means, I, I think UFC, I mean, Strike Force is almost pretty much UFC and you know, Strike Force was Showtime and everything. Ultimate Fighter China and your experience that, because you know you were, there you were a mentor and coach and what was your experience there like kind of training a lot of the um, actually, athletes i actually was like they had given me the michael bisbee fight in manchester england right 
And, um, but he had to win. He had just lost to uh, Ranger up. And then his next fight, he had to win. So after he won the fight, I was like, Hey, cause I remember at the time Gary Barrow was helping, you know, with my, my sponsorship and my, my management. And then uh, I was like, Hey, um, what's going on with Manchester? Because I haven't heard anything about it. He's all, they want to use you for something else. So Dana White flies me in and says, Hey Kong, you're going out there to uh, China and you're, you're gonna, you're gonna be me out there. I'm like, so I'm the Dana White, and he's like, yeah, you're going to take care of both teams. Then when I went out there, both teams needed help because at the time they didn't have, like, the right, like, coaching staff to take all their fighters to the next, next level. And so I say I know I'm, like, coaching both teams, helping out, running some practices, watching their coach, giving them tips, and then uh, doing what Dana White did. And, of course, the pay was – not that great. That's why I said I'd rather fight. But basically, if I would have opted out of that, basically, then I get put on the back burner. So I had to do it. And of course, I wanted to do it, but I didn't want to do it, you know, being away from home for eight weeks. And with that kind of pain, because I know being in Hollywood, and you kind of know what everyone's rate is for a reality show. I was lucky out if I was even skirting around seven, eight percent, like a lower level lead in a reality show would get, you know? So I was just like, and this not, I'd love to help out, but I'm not about, you know, I'm trying to fight like because my time is limited, you know. I'm already in my my 40s. I want to, I want to fight. But in order to continue to fight, I had to do these things. And just put it this way. They, they at one time they they, they had uh, stun gun Kim. They they tried to throw a fight without me in Macau. They couldn't even sell five thousand seats. I sold out against Rich Franklin, and we t- I I heard the hotel turned away four thousand people trying to get tickets the day of the fight. So I went out to promote the TV show. Next thing they're like, Hey Kung, can you do an open workout? I'm like, What do you mean do an open workout? I'm just here to promote the TV show. We need your help to promote the stun gun Kim. And I forget the guy from England. I was like, wow. Okay. So yeah, lucky I brought some workout shorts yeah. and you know, my, my, my trainer came along with me because he was part of the show. Cause we were supposed to promote it together. All right. Get some pads, put on some shin pads. We're going to do an open workout. And he's like, shit, you crazy. And you know, at this time, you know, you know, it's like, when am I going to fight? So I had to do everything that they asked. So I can get that fight at like one point, at one point you, you, you get like, like unmotivated because like, you don't know what's going to happen. So I said, and I kept calling Dana and usually he like picks up, he calls back right away. So I come back and I, I, I hear nothing about any bonuses or like, you know, what I'm going to get. So finally I get a call and they, they, they give me a bonus. It's not, it's not even what a, a Range Rover would get as a coach. Right. They just give me a bonus you know, I, I'm not going to complain. I was, I feel, hey, thank you, God, for money coming in so I can put food on the table for my family. But it came down to, man, the coach has got a better shake in the, you know, the, the other shows to get a, a Range Rover, right? And it was just, hey, here's some, here's a check. Guess what? Now you get to fight Michael Bisbee. I'm like, oh, okay. Oh, by the way, we might have you fight New Zealand. I'm like, I'm in. I'll fight. He's all, then he calls me back. He's all, you know, you're not a, a young buck anymore. So we're going to pull you because we don't want you to get uh, like risk any injury in a fight in New Zealand or Australia. I can't remember exactly where. And so you're just going to go straight to Macau, and, you know, and then uh, do the same thing you did for Rich Franklin. And guess what? Michael is number five seat. Just imagine if you beat him. I'm like, OK, I guess I'll do it. You know, so yeah. that's kind of like is, is the, I mean, is the pay part of the reason why i i, I well I, i'm just curious about because well, you seem I'm not like you hustle about my pay well i, I, got I, I definitely don't want to go down that I, I didn't want to go down that road for this this interview because i like to keep it about no it's about all right me, it's, but... it's it's public record that what i got paid right so you know people can look that up but for what i've done because i remember before they fired the vice president of the ufc china i don't want to bring up his name but great guy he basically told me, man, because of Yukon, we got out of the red. 
you know, um, your fight against um, Rich Franklin really, really boosted us. And now we have a presence in China. So they, that's why they had me doing all these things, the show, doing all this, you know, who else gets to play Dana, you know, on one of these reality shows. It's more like Dana didn't want to go out there. <laughs> the pollution level was crazy, you know. Um, I remember I came back, I had to recover. I was coughing black stuff out of my lungs, you know. I just look back and I just feel, okay, instead of complaining about it, thank you, God, for letting me experience this journey. Instead of being like sour about it, I'm like, now, guess what? I'm fighting for 1,215 UFC fighters from this date to this date. And I'm proud of that. I'm proud of that. And, and uh, you know, hopefully the fighters will get what their market value is and mm -hmm. where UFC has to pay the fighters more. And that's the class action Kung Lee with a handful of other fighters, but it says Kung Lee versus the UFC. So I am, I stepped up and I think I would have stepped up anyways, even though if, you know, Dana White didn't treat me the way he did, you know, like forcing me to fight and stuff like that. But I would have, I would have done it anyways, because, you know, one day my son, Anthony, at the time who was already, you know, training and my older son was training martial arts too. And maybe they wanted to fight in the UFC. I know my, my middle son, was always talking about, I want to fight, I want to fight, like, I want to be like you. So I said, okay, this is uh, my chance to help not only the, the the fighters now, the future, and maybe my son. So I, I stepped up for the, for the class action and, um, and, uh, you know, it's like the antitrust lawsuit against UFC. And then uh, here we are today, you know, talking about it. Yeah. It feels like you're, I mean, to me, you feel like a person that doesn't, complain and kind of go rolls rolls with what whatever but then so then for you to take a stand on something i think that's um you know very brave i'm sure you would it goes through your mind like do it should i really do this because it kind of puts you in sort of a awkward position let's just say without i had to do it because they dragged my name underneath the like through the mud already like after the fight against bisbing they're like oh kung lee's level was elevated for on HGH, I'm like, okay, your body produces HGH. First of all, why would I take HGH to help my performance in a fight? No, I would be taking anabolic, you know, really. And so I went back, I got a blood test and their blood tests didn't show any anabolic at all. It, and then because it was someone's research, Dr. Caitlin's research of 10 years, he was like the Olympic committee PED specialist, which is performance enhancing, right? He had a um, he had a ten year research on HGH. He got on uh, social media and said Kung Lee levels are normal. If you work out for thirty minutes and you go and take your test, it's going to be elevated. You sit in the sauna for thirty minutes, it's going to be elevated. Hmm. The only way you can get a close to accurate reading, you wake up, you fast, you go get your blood work, no exercising no getting your heart rate. It's like you wake up, you drive yourself, get that blood work, and that's how you get most accurate reading. And I even did another blood test to show everyone. And all my levels were normal, just like that, except my HGH level was normal instead of elevated 180 times. But if you sit in a sauna for 30 minutes, your, your, your HGH levels will elevate that high. They took me off my year suspension and eventually kept me on, on the contract for another year and change. And uh, then, you know, by that time I said, okay, enough is enough. I think this lawsuit, it was meant to be. And my career ends here and I'm going to step up and fight for all those other fighters. I felt like I had a, one or two more fights left in me, you know, because I was in really good shape. Who else would have been able to last four rounds and, you know, two and a half of the round was with the, the bone that holds up your eyeball was broken you know i was bleeding inside my face i'm sure you know as a martial artist if you get hit in the eye or in the nose don't blow your nose i had to blow my nose all the blood was stuck stuck right here so there's a picture of me blowing my nose and i'm standing there and i i, I post out a picture a lot and i remember i had to blow my nose and right after that i blew my nose all of a sudden i saw oh, everything was like puffy i was like ah oh, no i can't barely see now you know so at least i know what kind of person I would, I am in these kind of situations. I will not quit. I, I, when I watch you, I'm like, 
there's a couple times where you just kind of smile too and just kind of it's just so playful it's just uh it, it seems like maybe you're in in this other kind of like a just a higher level than most but are you do you experience the same things that most people would ex, you know experience like the the heart pounding the oh let's just you know call it out like fear i mean is there does that ever race your brain and then how do you overcome it there is always some kind of fear you're human but it's how you deal with it it's how you kind of embrace it you have to accept it in order for you to perform at a high level right so if you if you let the fear control your emotions then you're going out there half of what you are but you feed off the fear you feed off the excitement now you're at another level now you're in that matrix you know so a lot of times i remember it took a while i finally found that that zone where in practice i see a lot of stuff coming sure i still get hit but then a lot of people used to spar with me uh, and say i'm hard to hit because you find that zone and you then what what i do is i hit what's open and i defend what's coming and I block out everything in my mind. Everything is a reaction for a defense or a reaction to my offense and to hit what's open. That becomes like second nature. Well, thanks so much for this uh, talk. I think this is a perfect time to, to say thank you for uh, spending the time with me today and, and talking about um, your life and, and who you are. And I appreciate it. Sure, no problem.